All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I know it's late in the day on day four, so appreciate you coming along. So we're going to look now at um, Workflow Studio. So presumably you're here, you may be a developer or designer of applications, and increasingly we're seeing now people are needing to have workflows built into these things. Now there's lots of ways to go about that, and I'm going to show you one of those today. You're going to learn how to use Workflow Studio, which is a powerful visual editor for our AWS Step Functions service. So my name is Ben Moses, I'm a principal solutions architect. We're going to go straight into this, and then we're going to cut over, and this is mostly going to be live demo. I'll try and leave some time at the end for Q&A, but if not, I can always stop at the side here if anyone has any questions for me. So just a real quick introduction to Step Functions for anyone who's less familiar with it. So it's a workflow engine, it runs state machines, and there's really four main use case areas that we see people use this in. So with data processing, we have a feature called Distributed Map. It allows you to go over tens of thousands of parallel executions on data sets, so you can rapidly churn through big data problems. We see lots of customers use it for IT and security automation. So this could be things like automated incident response or to do with scaling infrastructure with a little bit more control. Machine learning is an increasingly popular use case. So imagine you have a, a data set. You might want to do some splitting of that. You may want to then do some training and automated testing. And you can orchestrate all of those pieces within Step Functions. And another final really popular use case here is microservices orchestration. So where perhaps you're using things like event-driven architecture and you're passing these messages about changes around. And when it reaches a microservice, you may want to then orchestrate something to do with that payload. So let's use a really simple example here. So you can think of this as a workflow. So here we've got an image that's being used as an input. And we need to do some processing here. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a thumbnail of the image, so do some processing. But we're also going to use one of our services to uh, identify features and store that metadata about the image so that it can be used later, perhaps in conjunction with that thumbnail. Now, it's very easy to reason what's happening here. Most of us are quite visual learners. We can see what's happening. You can, of course, create your state machines as code. And Step Functions supports this. You don't need to read the actual code itself here. The intent is to just show you that we have something. It's called Amazon States Language. And it's a definition type built on top of JSON. It allows you to programmatically create your workflows. However, if you're trying to sit down with a business persona, maybe it's a product manager or somebody from the business side, it's quite hard to get them to understand and reason what this code is doing for you. And that's where Workflow Studio comes in. So on the right-hand side there, that's a screenshot from Workflow Studio expressing the same workflow you saw on the left-hand side there. And so you can see if you start to name your components, your steps, your states in here, as something sensible that's recognizable and uses the same language throughout your business, people can start to understand exactly what's happening. It's far easier to reason about than when you're looking at code. And thankfully, it's quite portable to go backwards and forwards. So you can have your thing defined in Workflow Studio visually, but then you can export that ASL document. You can version that into your code base. You can modify, adapt, and extend it. And you can then just load that back into Workflow Studio and carry on editing visually if you'd like to. So we could talk through this, but what I thought would be better is to do a bit of a demo for you, walk you through how you create these things, and show you some of the features in Step Functions as well that help you to understand visually what's going on with your workflows too. So let's switch over now. OK. So we've got that same image. I'm going to keep that there just so I can keep referencing back to it so you understand where this is all coming from. So I said at the beginning with this, the intent here is to have some images as the input. So I've used Bedrock to just create some images here. So I have a, a beach scene, as you can see there, lovely generated beach image. We have a cityscape, just there. And no presentation will be complete without a nice dog picture too. So we're going to use these as our input. And I also mentioned that we needed to be able to store metadata as well. And so for that, we're going to use DynamoDB, simple table. So there's nothing in there right now. 
So if you want to start creating this thing, we're going to head into the Step Functions console. And from here, if we expand the menu on the left-hand side, I can go down to State Machines. Now, I've got a prepared one, which I'll show you shortly. But I thought, let's start with a completely blank canvas here. Now, when you go to create these, there's a load of use cases, some of which I talked about earlier. And you can pick these for like, quick starts. They'll put some building blocks in for you. You can then customize, add to, change as you like. We're going to start with a blank one. And here we are in the studio. So the best way to understand this is on the left-hand side, we have a palette, which can, includes all of our states. So these can be actions. And this is where we can talk to AWS services. So all 220 plus AWS services are available in there. And you can actually go across 10,000 API actions within Step Functions. Obviously, we talked about the need to maybe take branching logic. And that's where these flow components come in. So we have the ability to take a choice, depending on the output of a previous state, and start to introduce branching logic to go one way or another. We can have parallel. So if there's no reason to be linear in our workflow, we can branch out and we can do things in parallel together. We have map states where you can iterate through a set. And that can be something you load from something like an S3 bucket or from a JSON object that you pass in yourself. And there's a few others in here as well. And you'll see some of those as we start to build this up. And the very last one here is patterns. So these are repeated use cases that we see customers use. They're designed to be an easy way to just drop this thing on. It may put in one or two components and put some configuration into them as a sensible default. And then you can go from there. In the center, we've got this infinite scrolling canvas that we can move around. We can zoom in and out. And as you start to add your components, it'll keep auto laying out everything for you. And on the right-hand side, we've got the Properties dialog. So right now, we're in the properties of the workflow itself. But as we start to drop pieces in, we can start to customize them and give them actions here. Really important thing to call out at the start is a week or two ago, the Step Functions team released a new processing method inside this called JSONata, which supersedes the previous JSON path. I'm intentionally going to do this demo using JSON path because an awful lot of the examples that are still out there will still be in JSON path today. But as you start to get familiar with this tool, I'd encourage you to try JSONata out. There's plenty of really good documentation on it. And it will start to see all the samples get updated to that too. So I'm going to pick JSON path for this, and then we can get going. So that very first step that we had to perform was extract image metadata. So for that, I have a Lambda function that we can use. And it's literally as simple as taking the AWS Lambda invoke and dropping that into the canvas. Obviously, there needs to be some configuration for this now. So if I scroll down on this properties window, you can see that we're using an optimized integration type. There's about 15 services that support these. And it's designed to just make it easier to configure them. But all of the services and all of the actions you can drop in here, you can use the normal AWS SDK parameters. You just pass it in as a JSON object. So given that Lambda is one that is optimized, we get the ability to just come in here, and we get to just select from all of the Lambda functions that I can see with my IAM role. So one of them here is called Metadata. And we're going to select that. And that's it. That's done. So we're going to build this up iteratively. So right now, I can go over to Create. And helpfully, Step Functions is going to say, it looks like you're trying to invoke that Lambda function. Do you want me to create an execution role for your state machine that has the ability to do that for you? So my answer is going to be, yes, please. And for almost every service you integrate with, Step Functions has the ability to suggest IAM roles. Sometimes with some of the more data sensitive services, it will give you the config that's needed, but it asks you to go and add that to the role yourself. So that's all created now. It's ready to be executed. So let's do that. Now, when we start an execution, we can give it an initial payload. And this is typically how you'll see it used. When you call it from another service, you're usually going to pass something to it, whether it's an event bridge state or something from API Gateway. So for this demo, I've just got some of these stored locally, one for each of these images that we talked about earlier. Uh, so let's pick the beach example. So in this, all I'm doing is passing in the name of the bucket where those images are stored, the name of our Dynamo table, and the object key for that beach image that you saw. So we'll start the execution. 
I'm going to tidy this up and create a bit of real estate. So you'll get some information at the top about the execution itself. You have this middle section, which gives you a graph view, which is where we're going to be spending most of our time. But it also gives you a tabular view underneath of everything that's happened from the moment you hit start execution to it being succeeded at the end. And each of these is expandable. You can see every piece of information about what came into a given state, what the state did with it, and what came out the other side of it. So from a debugging and trying to rationalize what's happening in your system point of view, super powerful. So we only have one step right now. It's this Lambda invoke. So we're going to select that. And on the right-hand side, we've got a few tabs. I'm going to pick the Input and Output tab. So hopefully that's readable. If it's not, somebody point up, and I can always just zoom it. Um, you see the execution input that I gave from that JSON file. And the state that has come back is the return from my Lambda function. So this is coming back saying the image is valid because it was either a JPEG or a PNG. Brilliant. So how did we get that output from that state machine? So to find that, let's go back into the editor, and I'll show you. Because one of the core pieces of this, once you've built your workflow up, is to decide how you want your data to flow through it. So in our Lambda function, as well as the configuration, we had that inputs and output tab here. So we can manipulate what's happening inside the execution as we go. And helpfully, again, because this is an optimized one, it gives you an example of what a typical Lambda output might look like. So you can see all the full things in here, the executed version, the payload, which is what comes back from the Lambda function. But you also get all of the metadata in there. And typically, for your workflows, you aren't going to need that. So if we scroll down, you can see some of these things. And by default, when you use that invoke Lambda action block, it puts this filter on for you, something called an output path. And that's saying, from the root of the object that comes back, I actually only care about the payload what came back from Lambda, basically. And that's how we saw that in the next piece. Step functions recently introduced something called variables, which now means that when you get things back, you can go and store them as like a global variable in your execution, and you can reference them later. So before that existed, what was a common pattern is you would chain the input and the output through. So if you needed those variables that I passed in at the beginning, the table name, the image key, et cetera, you would have to keep them and retain them. And the way that we do that is with a result path. So what this allows you to do is say, I want to keep the root object that you passed in right at the very beginning. And anything you get back, you want to append it as a sub-object. So let's do that now. So if I give that a path of dollar dot, and then let's call it uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, image metadata. Now, one thing that's important to note is the output path is the very last thing that manipulates this payload. So we now can't use that anymore because it won't exist. It will be elsewhere. So let's take that off. Let's save it. And let's execute. Again, we'll just load in that beach JSON and let that run. And now what you'll see in the input and output is you'll see that we've retained that original input, the bucket name, the image table, and everything else. We have a new property here called image metadata, but we've now got the entire execution underneath. And we didn't want that. We only wanted the payload. So there's an easy fix for that. If we come straight back to where we just were in input and output, and we get to use something called a result selector. Now, the syntax for this, it's all very well defined in the, in the documentation. And it looks very much like JSON. And what we do is we uh, have a property. So this one was called image valid. But because we want to set the value of that dynamically, we have to suffix it with a dot dollar. So that's the property name. We now need to give it a value. And the value is very similar to what you saw before. It's going to be dollar dot payload dot image valid. We're going to take just that piece. So let's save that and give it one last execute. Not forgetting to pass in our original JSON. And now what we should see is 
we've got a cleaned up version of our state output. So that's how you would want this to look in reality. You have all of your original payload that came in, but you now have an extra property called image metadata, and inside that object, you saw image valid true, which is what's come back from your Lambda function. So, while we can sit here and I can drag all of the other blocks on, you can watch me configuring all the input and output. So it might be a bit more engaging if we just head back to the Step Functions console and open up a pre-prepared version of this that I took the time to, to complete earlier. So this should resemble what you saw on this image here. So I'll zoom this in. Let me hide some of these so we can have enough space. So we have the Lambda function at the top, very much how you, you saw as we created together then. And we go into one of these choice states. And all we're looking for in here is we're saying, by default, if the choice state doesn't determine anything, we're going to go down to this not supported image type. However, there is a rule that says if the image data is true, we're going to come down here and store that data. That's using one of these DynamoDB put item blocks. Again, it's an optimized integration type. And it's as simple as just providing your item that you want to put in there. So for us, it's just the key of the S3 object for now and the table name. And that will go and write the item into Dynamo. After that, we're going to come down and we're going to do some tasks in parallel. So this is the pieces you saw on the slides earlier. So on one side, we're going to do another Lambda invoke to do our thumbnail and have that created. But then we're also going to call out directly to recognition. So again, you don't have to write any custom code or use SDKs to do this. You can just drag and drop the block, pass in the configuration properties for it, which are as simple as providing the bucket name and the object key. That's it. And so after that, recognition will give a load of output. And for this one, just to keep the demo a bit cleaner, I've just said take the top category, top label, just have that one string come out of this. And then once it's completed that, it is going to update our item in our Dynamo table. So if we execute this now, let's use the beach scene again. And let's let that run. Now, if you've got more branching logic happen, or let's say, for example, I passed in an invalid image, you would see it actually take a different path. And you can see for each execution in your execution history where things have gone. So if we come down here, we can see the store image metadata has succeeded. We haven't kept any output from DynamoDB. We didn't need that. We headed straight into the parallel action. The thumbnail is created, recognition executed. And you can see here the top category it got was nature and outdoors. And we've updated our table. And so to see the result of this, if we go back into Dynamo now, we have one item in there. So I'm using the S3 object key as the ID. You can see that it's got the recognition label of Nature and Outdoors. And then you can also see the new S3 key to the newly created thumbnail. So again, in our bucket, we now have the thumbnail. We have a smaller version of this. So that's a way just to illustrate how we can take something like this. We can go and achieve that programmatically without the need to write a single line of code. We can show our stakeholders how to use that and make it very, very visual for them as well. So that is all we've got time for on this one. There is an awful lot of depth you can get into with step functions. I'd really recommend taking this resource away. It's a hands-on workshop that you can do at your own pace. And it teaches you everything you need to know from building up from those basics through to the more advanced use cases, which you see a lot more filtering, a lot more input and output manipulation. So I've left us just. 30 seconds at the end now. We don't have the time for the Q&A, but I will stand down at the side here. If anyone's got any questions, please do feel free to come and ask me. If you could fill out the survey, that would be fantastic. I hope it was useful. Thank you, everyone.